Greetings. If you made it this far, welcome to the Chapter 19 Physics 1 Lecture on Wave Mechanics. Let's begin today by considering a pendulum, shall we? Is everyone familiar with the concept of a pendulum? It's really just a weight on a string or a cable of some kind. So you can use anything you want. You could use a, a shoelace and tie something at the end of it if you like, if you want to follow along and do this experiment at home. But consider, if you will, a pendulum. Now, for the pendulum I'm going to use today, at least for starters, I'm going to use this old head headset, this uh, old pair of headphones that I never use anymore. I'm going to put a clip on the end of it for a little bit of a weight. Okay. Now, <coughs> if you swing a pendulum, obviously it's going to swing back and forth, right? But what's going to affect the time that it takes for the pendulum to make a full back and forth swing? We call that the period, or the time for one vibration or oscillation, one complete cycle. So what could possibly affect the period of a pendulum? Well, <coughs> the uh, obvious guesses are things like the mass, uh, the angle, the length of the string. So let's examine those one at a time, shall we? So for starters, I gotta do it this way because uh, I unfortunately decided I was gonna wear a white shirt today and I probably shouldn't have done that. But there's a fix for everything. <coughs> the fix this time apparently is for me to uh, just use the chair because it's dark. So, I've conveniently tied a knot here just so I can always hold it at the same place, all right? So for starters, let's try and just see what the period of the pendulum is normally, okay? So that's the time that it takes for it to go forward and back, okay? One, one thousand, about one second, right? How about if we change the angle? One, one thousand, and try to get it in the frame just a little bit better. One, one thousand, it doesn't matter if it's low, one, one thousand. We're all the way up here at 90 degrees. One, 1,000. <coughs> so the angle doesn't seem to affect it too much. What about if we try to put more mass on it? I'm going to take another clip here, and I'm going to put it on the end so that they overlap. That looks pretty sturdy. OK, I'm going to hold it from the same place from the knot, and I'm going to try it again. One, 1,000. It's about the same, isn't it? One, 1,000. Well, <coughs> it doesn't look like the mass changed anything, or the angle. So what's the only thing left? How about if we change the length of the string? Let's make it nice and short first. That's a lot faster than one second, isn't it? How about if we made it much longer than it was before? Okay, let's start with a, a nice shallow angle just so we can get everything in the frame easily here. that again. One, one thousand. Not even close, right? Much, much longer. One, one thousand. Two, one thousand. <coughs> so we can immediately see that the one factor that changes the period of the pendulum is the length of the pendulum itself. Now generally, we measure the length of a pendulum from the pivot point or from wherever it's being held to the center of mass of the bob at the end. But that, believe it or not, isn't actually the only thing that can affect the period of a pendulum. Mathematically, if you'd be so kind as to follow me to the whiteboard, we describe the period of a pendulum this way. We said the period depends upon pi times the square root of the length of the pendulum divided by surface gravity. Now why is this last bit important? Obviously this pendulum would have a different period on the moon, right? Or on the surface of Mars or out in space where if you just if you're on the International Space Station or something and you pull the pendulum like this and you let it go it would just stay there, right? No net force. 
relative, of course, to the rest of the International Space Station. <coughs> so the re really the only variables in this equation are the length of the pendulum and surface gravity, the acceleration due to gravity here at the surface. No, Ninja. I need the board. Thank you. <coughs> in any case, this is so true that the design of the grandfather clock because that was based strictly upon the length of the pendulum to keep time. That was so regular that you could actually use it to keep time. For those of you who play the piano or another musical instrument and are familiar with the workings of a metronome, it's very much the same thing. <coughs> now, let's say that we wanted to make a graph of the position of the pendulum bob over the course of time. Now, if we wanted to look at just how the pendulum moves one more time very briefly, it doesn't move in a straight line, right? And because it moves along an arc, if we were talking about the horizontal motion of the pendulum or the horizontal position of this pendulum over the course of time, we can see that it's changing the most here in the middle and the amount that it moves horizontally decreases as its height increases, as it swings further upward, right? Okay, so let's just try to plot the position of the pendulum bob, the horizontal position of the pendulum bob. Let me try and center this just a little bit. instead. This will work for sure. There we go, that's better. Okay, so let's say that <coughs> we wanted to try to plot the horizontal position of the pendulum bob with respect to time. This will be our time axis or independent variable, and we'll call this, this will be the x position as a function of time. Let's start when the pendulum bob was in the middle of one of these swings, shall we? in the middle, whoops, in the center of the swing. Okay, if we're going to start in the center of the swing, obviously that puts us here, right? Let's say it's moving this way, so over the course of time it's going to move here, 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 and then it'll eventually slow down and stop moving horizontally this way, at which point it'll start to move backward, right? And presumably, it should do the same thing on the other side. This is what we call a sine wave. S-I-N-E. Now, <coughs> if we look at how fast it's moving horizontally at different points of this arc, obviously at the bottom of the swing, when it's in the middle, it's moving its fastest, right? And if we remember our definition of velocity, Velocity is defined to be change in position divided by change in time, right? So its rate of change of position, or its velocity, is greatest here when it's in the middle. And it's going to start to slow down and slow down and slow down until finally, here at the end point, when it's all the way up at the top of one of its swings, it has stopped, right? At which point it starts to move backward. When it starts to move backward, of course, 
it's going to move faster and faster and faster until eventually it stops and starts to move forward again. <coughs> this rate of change curve is what we call a cosine curve. So one is really truly the rate of change of the other, or the cosine curve is how quickly the sine curve is changing. You can think of the cosine curve as the velocity curve for the position of the pendulum bob, if you like. It actually translates perfectly. In any case, these are what we call waves. <coughs> and I know that's just a little bit abstract. But we'll get to what exactly a wave is in just a little bit. For now, let's try to understand what the anatomy of these wave structures is, shall we? So for starters, let's give ourselves the same axes. This can be time or physical space, perhaps. Actually, you know what? Let's make this horizontal distance, and let's make this vertical distance. Now, in this case, this will actually be the physical profile of a wave. Like if you were looking at a wave traveling past you, or if you were in the water, you know, out at the beach in Santa Cruz or something. So. Our sine curve looks something like this, right? <coughs> now this wave has actually several components, or several pieces. The actual physical horizontal space that a wave takes up from either the beginning of one wave to the beginning of the next, or from what we call peak to peak, at the highest part to the highest part, or from trough to trough, that one would be off the board. But in any case, <coughs> from one corresponding point to another corresponding point on the next wave is what we call the wavelength. The physical height that the wave occupies <coughs> is something that we call the amplitude. Now the way that we define the amplitude is not from the lowest point to the highest point, it's half that distance from the middle to the top, the middle to the bottom, half the distance from the bottom to the top, however you want to call it. This is called the amplitude. My cats are trying to push the chair. <laughs> In any case, the amplitude <coughs> is generally a measurement of, or a lot of times at least, the amount of energy that's in a wave. And if you think about waves at the beach, obviously the higher ones, the taller ones, have more kinetic energy in them, right? Stands to reason. It makes a lot of sense. <coughs> there is an exception, of course. Uh, light is also a wave. It's actually a wave-particle duality, but we're not going to get into that one just yet. But suffice to say that light definitely behaves like waves do. <coughs> and the energy in a light wave, or a photon, or a quantum of light energy, whatever you want to call it, actually depends upon the frequency of the light. And remember we said which one has more energy, the one that oscillates slowly or the one that oscillates quickly? Well, the one that has the higher frequency, the one that cycles more times per unit time or per second, whatever you want to think of it. Now, the frequency then is this other really funny thing, and that's related to the period or the time that it takes for a wave to cycle. We say that the frequency is the inverse or one over the period, or the period is one over the frequency. I know that's kind of a funny thing to think, right? But I'll give us an example in just a second so that it'll make better sense. For now, 
let's just try to figure out what the units of these should be, right? If we're talking about actual physical distance for a wavelength, what should the unit be? Something like meters, right? For amplitude, that's a tricky one, right? If we're talking about amplitude in the sense of actual kinetic energy, it might be joules. If you're talking about the actual physical amplitude of a wave like what you would see at the beach in the water, that might be meters. So that one's a, a little trickier, right? But what about these? Well, period is the amount of time that it takes, right? For one cycle or one wave to complete. So that one should be fairly obvious. You want to use something like seconds. Frequency, on the other hand, is one over seconds, right? Or that's something that we call hertz. Inverse seconds or one over seconds. Everybody say hi to Lucky. Okay, anyway. <clears throat> Let's try to put an example together such that we can try to make sense of all of this. Let's say you're out at the beach, right? You're out at Santa Cruz at that part out by the boardwalk where that old broken down pier is mostly busted up and mostly sunk beneath the waves, right? And so let's say that, well, let's just erase most of this altogether. So let's say <coughs> you're standing out on the old pier, right? You go out to have some saltwater taffy or a, you know, a pretzel or whatever, and you look out over the water, and you see part of the old pier sticking out, right, from the water. And you know, let's say there's a seagull sitting on it or something, right? <coughs> Just so there's some easy landmark for you to recognize. Now let's say that just because of you being extremely clever and, I don't know, triangulating from the lengths of shadows or something, you know, just because you're that clever of a human being, you realize that the actual physical space in between the waves is one meter, right? That's your wavelength. And you're sitting here and you're watching the waves lap up against this part of the, this old broken down post, part of the old broken down pier, right? and you're just watching the waves lap up against it, and you realize that the frequency is one hertz, or there's one per second. One wave hits this every second. How fast, then, is the wave speed? This, by the way, is the Greek letter nu. This is not a V, and although we're using it for wave speed, I know that might be a little bit confusing, but generally we use the letter nu, which kind of looks like a V for wave speed. <clears throat> the only other uh, time that we use anything else for wave speed is if we're talking about the speed of light, but that's a constant, right? This is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. 10 to the 8 meters per second. The speed of light is always this, regardless. Now, if you if you're sitting here and you realize that these waves are one meter long and one wave laps up against this post every second, how fast is this moving? Well, it's got to be one meter per second, right? Because it covers a physical distance of one meter every one second, or one wave hits it every second and the waves are one meter long, right? So therefore, it stands to reason that the speed of a wave depends upon the frequency and the wavelength. And as a matter of fact, if you multiply the frequency by the wavelength, you always get the wave speed. That's where that comes from. Wave speed is frequency times wavelength. Now, <coughs> not all waves have this kind of waveform, this what we call transverse waveform. <clears throat> Most of the waves that we've seen so far, things like light, are actually transverse waves. There's actually an electromagnetic wave that oscillates one way and a magnetic wave that oscillates perpendicular to that. And they oscillate together, both of them transverse or perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Meaning, 
if or perpendicular, that's another way to say transverse. So let's say the light wave is going this way. The electric wave would be going up and down then, and the magnetic wave would be going back and forth like this. But they're moving this way together from, let's see, that would be your right to your left, right? This way. <coughs> so the energy is actually oscillating perpendicular, both of them, the electric portion and the magnetic portion, or oscillating perpendicular to the way that the light is actually going, right? So if you turn on your flashlight, the light would be going this way, right? If you're pointing the, the flashlight this way, the light would actually go that way. But the energy actually oscillates perpendicular, not only to each other, but also to the direction that the light is moving. Funny stuff, right? Anyway, we'll come back to that <coughs> in a little while after we talk about electricity and magnetism a little more and uh, also light. But suffice to say that, at least for our purposes, it's not really necessary for us to get too much into that at this juncture. What we do need to know is this, that waves can oscillate transverse, right? or perpendicular to the direction that they are propagating. This is actually a lot easier to see if you have some medium like this that is much more stretched out. Like so. And unfortunately, I only have a plastic sleeve, so this is not going to be easy to do. But. you can see just a little bit, right? Now, <coughs> while it is true that the energy can oscillate in one direction, like this, transverse to the direction that the energy is actually propagating, the energy can also oscillate longitudinally. So if I just took this and I bunched it up a little bit and I let it go, the energy actually moves straight up and down the slinky, right? This time the energy just moves straight up and down the slinky, right? We call that a longitudinal wave. Now that wasn't the best of demonstrations, so I've included for you a link to a better slinky demo video it's uh, both in the comments and on the uh, lecture page itself. So, <coughs> if you want to see a, a better Slinky demo, there is one provided for you. I'm sorry I don't have anyone else to hold the other end of the Slinky. and My cats definitely won't do that, no matter you know how much I try to bribe them with treats or whatever. <coughs> in any case, we saw that some waves are transverse, right? The energy oscillates in a direction other than the distance that the wave itself is traveling. But some waves are longitudinal, meaning the energy bunches up in the direction that the wave itself is moving. Now this is actually how sound works. Sound, the way that you're able to hear me right now is sound is presumably coming out of your computer speaker, which is bunching up the air, right? Causing a what we call a compression and then a rarefaction and a compression and a rarefaction and a compression and a rarefaction. And that bunches up the air next to that, that bunches up the air next to that, that bunches up the air next to that, and eventually it gets to your eardrum where it vibrates your eardrum and sends a signal to your brain that you interpret as sound, right? And that is how sound actually works. <coughs> But what happens if two waves travel through the same part of the medium at the same time? Well, by now you've probably figured out that waves are actually energy moving through media, right? And in the case of a wave at the beach, you're talking about kinetic energy moving through the physical medium of water. Well, let's just say we want to use that example and try to figure out what happens when waves collide. So let's say you're down at the beach in Santa Cruz. Hi, Lucky. Right, here's the beach, out here's the water. And let's say a wave is coming in this way. 
and another wave is coming in this way, and they meet here. What's going to happen at this point? Well, that actually depends, doesn't it? Now, <laughs> let me give you a couple of scenarios. Let's say you have one wave that's like this. <coughs> and let's just look at the first period of the wave, shall we? And let's say we've got another wave that's in phase, meaning the peaks and the peak and the and the troughs are in the same place, right? Let's say our first wave has amplitude A, and our second wave also has amplitude A. What happens when we add them together? Well, that seems like a relatively simple matter, right? If you have two high waves that come together, it seems like they would make an even higher wave, right? You have one wave amplitude A, one another wave amplitude A, that should give us a wave of amplitude 2A, right? This is what we call constructive interference. Now, <coughs> it is possible that we could have another scenario. Let's say this is the same wave as on the other side, right? So it still has an amplitude of A. This is a negative amplitude of A, if you want to call it that. <coughs> and let's say that we've got one wave that's one half cycle or 180 degrees out of phase with this wave. So this wave also has an amplitude of A, but we've got a negative portion here and a positive portion here. If we add them together, we've got minus A and plus A. What do we get? We get nothing, right? This is called destructive interference. Now, <coughs> if this is true, if what I said is actually true, <coughs> then we should be able to see this phenomenon in real life, right? So let's say that you've got two light waves. Light waves, if they add together in the wrong way, they should be able to cancel each other out, even if it's the same kind of light, right? You believe me if I said that if you shone a laser in through a slit so that different points of the light that come through the slit can interfere with each other, that at some point it's going to cancel the light out. It'll make dark points, light and dark, that oscillate or alternate in between them. It's a little crazy to think, right? But as a matter of fact, if you shine a laser through a really thin slit, what happens is each point of the light that comes out on the other side of the slit acts like its own waves, wave or its own light source and that can interfere either constructively and make a really bright spot or destructively and make a dark spot or a completely dark spot altogether, right? Be a destructive interference. Now if that's true, then there should be some evidence of this. We should be able to take a light and shine it through some kind of aperture and show that we get some kind of interference pattern, bright and dark oscillation, right? Alternation in between bright and dark spots. Now, I really wanted to be able to show this to you myself, uh, but unfortunately, we don't have access to the classroom, and I don't have lasers and aperture slits and all that stuff sitting around the house. But I did uh, provide a link to a video from MIT so that's uh, also on. Uh, there's a link to that on the uh, on the uh, lecture page. So please have a look. <coughs> hit pause. This is a good time to hit pause. Uh, go get a glass of water and then watch the video. It's about two minutes long, and there's both single and double slit interference with a red laser, a yellow laser, and a green laser. It's pretty good. In any case. Sometimes, the energy in a medium can cause what we call a standing wave configuration. Now, I can't do this either because, you know, I don't have a standing wave motor sitting around the house either. But, I did provide a link to a standing wave video as well. And what a standing wave is, is imagine you've got a string. <coughs> 
Now if this string has a certain length, right, let's put together a couple of scenarios here. So the string has a certain length. Now let's say that you want to vibrate the string, right? On the end of the string, you have it hooked over a pulley with a weight on it or whatever, so it's pulled taut. And the other side, you have some kind of motor, right, that vibrates the string. If you can get the frequency just right, you can get it so that it vibrates kind of like this. And this spot here in the middle doesn't move. We call that a node, right? And these are called anti-nodes. Now, I'm a terrible artist. These are actually supposed to be the same size. It's kind of embarrassingly bad. Let me drop it again. That's a little better, right? Okay, so there's a spot right here that doesn't move. <coughs> and it'll just look like these parts are kind of bowing back and forth. But the, the spot in the middle won't move, right? This is one wavelength because you've got it starting here and ending back in the same place, the same thing for the opposite configuration, right? It could also maybe do something like this. That would be one and a half wavelengths, right? Two anti-nodes. This would be one wavelength from here to here. Could maybe do this. That's two wavelengths. That's two and a half wavelengths, and so on. These are all possible standing wave configurations, what we call harmonics in music, right? In any case, <coughs> if you give it just the right amount of energy at just the right frequency, these standing wave configurations are possible based on the length of the string. The incoming wave generally is in phase with the reflected wave if they have the same frequency and wavelength. And the spots where the medium doesn't move, like I said, those are called nodes, and the largest points are called anti-nodes. These actually happen because of this interference phenomenon, the same reason that if you shine a laser through a couple of slits, you get alternating bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark patterns. Now, if a car drives past you, let's say you know, you're standing out on the street talking to a friend of yours, eating a sandwich, whatever, right? <clears throat> if you're out on the street and a car drives past you, what does it sound like? Something like that, right? The pitch sounds higher when the car is coming towards you, but then it sounds lower when the car is moving away from you, right? To begin with, <coughs> if this car is going to make sound, here's my awesome drawing of a car, okay? So let's say this car is going to make some sound. Now, as this sound propagates out into the universe, what is the shape of one wave front going to look like? Let me rephrase that. The sound that is made at one instant in time, right? One shot of the internal combustion engine pushing the piston, one brief instant in time. <coughs> Excuse me. What is the wave front of that wave going to look like? Well, is it going to move in any one different di in any one direction differently or faster than any other? No, of course not, right? Why would it? So it would probably move equally in all directions, like a sphere. Now, if you're in this car, it's going to appear to you like the sound is moving out in all directions equally, right? However, let's say that you're a bystander. Now what's going to happen is the car is going to start here and it's going to release some sound, right? And then it's going to move here and it's going to release some sound again. By this time, this wave has gotten bigger, right? 
It's going to move here. It's going to release some more sound. This wave has gotten bigger. This wave has gotten bigger. And so on. And we're starting to see a pattern here, right? <coughs> Oops. That should be closer here. So these sound waves, while evenly spaced here, and evenly spaced here, <coughs> are getting farther and farther apart behind and closer and closer together in the front. Right? Now, <coughs> if you have sound waves that have a really short wavelength, what is that going to sound like? Short wavelength means high frequency, right? High frequency means high pitch. So when the car is coming towards you, all those sound waves get bunched up together, right? It'd be a smaller one and a bigger one and a bigger one and a bigger one and a bigger one. And as this person hears it, it's going to sound like a bunch of small little short wavelength sound waves. And so as the car is coming towards you, right, it's got a high pitch. But if you were standing behind the car or as the car passes you, it sounds like On the other side, the wavelengths are longer, right? The converse argument can then be made that if you have a longer wavelength, you have a lower frequency and therefore a lower pitch. So as the car goes past you, the pitch, the sound that the car appears to make sounds lower. When the car moves towards you, the sound waves are bunched up. When the car moves away from you, the sound waves are stretched out. And that's what gives rise to this apparent change in the sound that the car makes. Whereas if you're inside the car, the wavelength of the sound, the frequency of the sound, the pitch of the sound appears the same, right? If you're coasting along at 30 miles an hour, it's just going to sound like you're coasting along at 30 miles an hour. But to someone standing on the curb, it sounds like We call this the Doppler effect. Now I know my handwriting is terrible and it may have been a little bit difficult to follow along but fortunately <coughs> I've also included a video that showcases the Doppler effect. Okay? I know, my handwriting is terrible. But suffice to say that the Doppler effect is a very real phenomenon. We've all experienced it so we know it exists, right? <coughs> and now we know the name. Now. If this is true, this should be true for all kinds of waves, not just sound, right? This should also be true for, let's say, light waves, for example. Now, let's say that <coughs> we're talking about some object that is approaching you, right? Let's say we're here on the Earth, and some distant star is moving toward us, right? If some distant star is moving towards us, it's going to look like the light waves are shorter than if the star was just stationary relative to us, right? <coughs> that means the light would get shorter in wavelength, higher in frequency, right? And that would change the color towards the blue end or the higher energy, low wavelength end of the electromagnetic spectrum, or it would shift the color of the star towards the blue. So we call that a blue shift. Now it's probably no surprise for you to think that uh, we call the opposite something very similar, right? <laughs> if some object is moving away from us here on the Earth, it's going to look like the wavelengths are stretched out, the frequency is lower, and the color is going to shift towards the red end of the electromagnetic spectrum, and so we call this a red shift.
Now something really interesting happens if the object that's creating sound waves or light waves or whatever happens to move close to the speed of the wave itself. Now let's say you've got some kind of fighter jet or something moving at the speed of sound, right? It's going to create a sound wave and because it's moving at the speed of sound it's going to create another sound wave and it's going to keep up with it. It's going to create another sound wave, it's going to keep up with it. It's going to create another sound wave and all of these sound waves are going to bunch up on top of each other. So as you stack sound upon sound upon sound upon sound it doesn't take very long before all of this sound energy becomes very dense. And if this hits your eardrum, it sounds very loud. We call that a sonic boom. Now, the video that I've linked for you, uh, both in the class notes and on the lecture page, showcase not only the Doppler effect and the propagation of sound waves, in a way that's animated is much better than I can draw it. <coughs> but also it uh, shows the wave configuration of a sonic boom very nicely. In any case, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, please stay safe and uh, I'll see you all for chapter 20.